Well, today's lecture is on computer-aided instruction, which is often abbreviated CAI. When computers first appeared, they were very mysterious things, and comparatively few people could either understand them or cope with them or use them in any way. So it was natural that a fair number of machines turned up in university circles where that's their business. And since teaching is a business also, it was not very long before the questions arose, can we use computers to aid in teaching? It's a very, very natural question to arise, although it's surprising how many professors in universities never think about the question of teaching. Now there's a story from ancient Greek times to Alexander the Great that there was no royal road to geometry. Yes, there were royal roads which he could walk on. There were royal roads for his messengers to go up and down. But there was no royal road to geometry. Everybody had to do it the same. It's very, very much like learning a mile in four minutes. There really isn't some easy way. Coaching and money will help a little bit, but basically there is no easy way. And this goes back to 300 and some BC. Now there's a long history of people wanting to know without the pain of actually learning. In the Brave New World by Aldous Huxley, for example, he discusses a method which was sleep learning. They put a microphone underneath your pillow and as you slept, the microphone gently said things like the Nile is the long longest river in Africa and so on. Well, he points out what happens and how it doesn't work. Now, one of the years I was at Bell Labs, just when I don't know, but it was fairly early on, uh, there was a thing called Dianetics that appeared. It first appeared in a science fiction magazine, and later on it appeared in more popular places, and there are now institutes. In fact, last time I went through Santa Cruz, I think there was still an institute there on Dianetics. The idea was that it would somehow or other, in their words, clear your mind of all the mistakes and then you would never again reason falsely. Well, it's still around, but by common consent, most of us don't believe it works. <clears throat> and indeed, of all the methods you read about and all the methods you read in books about rapid reading or this or that, it's easy to observe that people who've gone through that do not dominate the world. For example, meditation is supposed to be good for you. Well, do you observe that the leaders in the society, in any particular sector even, are heavily people who meditated? If not, uh, meditation isn't the way to success, if that's what you want. Now, meditation may do something else, make you happier in another way. And some of these other courses may make you happier in another way. But in success in the real world as measured in the past, there have been no royal roads, in spite of all the advertising you hear and so on. Yet, that cannot be a proof there will not be one tomorrow, or in particular, given a machine with all its abilities, can we combine normal learning with a computer to speed up, or make easier, or do anything to help the process of learning? It's a perfectly legitimate question. It's one which you cannot afford to ignore. Now, before I get into this business, I have to discuss another very important factor which is neglected. It should be part of your education. It's called the Hawthorne effect. It's named after a plant of Western Electric at Hawthorne. Some Bell Lab people, psychologists, said, well, let us see if we can improve productivity by various methods, such as painting the walls a pleasant color. So they went into a plant, took a room, and painted the walls pink, and sure enough, productivity rose. They changed the lighting to a softer lighting, and productivity rose. They changed this to that, and productivity rose. Everything they did productivity rose. And one of them got suspicious and quietly reestablished 
pretty much the original conditions. Productivity arose. Why? The Hawthorne effect. If the people working for you believe you care, they will respond better than if you don't. If I come into class and tell you I'm teaching by a new wonderful method, you respond by being more attentive. And the teacher responds because it's a new method. They are more excited. So lo and behold, the class performs better because I'm using a new method. The method may in fact be worse, but the Hawthorne effect will make it look better. And this is what happens to a great extent. When you're reasonably good, changes by and large will be bad. But with the Hawthorne effect, make almost any change look better than what you were doing. Until it becomes an established method, and then you go right back to having lost the effect. Now this vitiates almost every study of teaching. Unless they make allowance for the Hawthorne effect, you cannot depend upon the conclusions. No way. It's a very, very real phenomenon. It's not a small one. Now, if you think you allow for it, I remind you of the lecture last week on the double-blind experiment, why the doctors finally were driven to doing double-blind experiments. In a way, that is partially the effect of a Hawthorne. It is that people anticipate and so they respond better both the doctors and the patients. The same way, the students and the professor will both respond better by a new method of teaching. My conclusion from all this is, the best method of teaching is probably one which is constantly changing. So the students think it's new, and the prof thinks it's new, and the Hawthorne effect produces better learning. Not that there's anything behind it, except this subconscious expectation, which in the learning process is almost everything. Now let me talk about one of the first methods of using uh, machines. You understand a professor has got to grade papers, particularly in a more elementary course, there's a lot of course grading, keeping records, and so on. So one professor built what he called the grader. You're assigned in the course a bunch of problems. The professor takes those same problems, writes out how to calculate the answers, and he also adds what is the range of input variables, how, what range can x be, for example, must it be a positive integer or something, and what is the leniency I will give you in not being exactly right, how many digits must you get right. So all he's got to do is write the same problem, and from term to term he can change. Now when you think you've got it going right, you call the grader. The machine generates some random data, runs it through your problem, through the professor's problem. If they agree, you pass. If they don't, you're wrong. And it enters it automatically into the professor's private file. Now we can also measure, if you want, the number of instructions, or this or that, or how much machine time it took, and so on. And he can also, whenever he wants, to deliver averages, variances, and so on, both over the whole single exam, over the whole class, or one single student over a whole set of exams. He can do all kinds of things very, very rapidly. Now, it can be changed term to term. All the professor has to do is to change the problems, submit his new solutions and the ranges, and there he is. Very flexible. Well, that sounded good to me. About three years later, I was back on campus to give some kind of a speech, dedication, and I inquired about it wasn't in use. Why? Well, they had changed the monitor system of the machine, and so some small change would have to be made in the grader, and nobody did it. Struck me as rather odd. So, since I frequently went to universities, I started inquiring, and I found this happened many times. Somebody would build a program which would greatly decrease the apparent mechanical labor the professor had to grade papers or keep records and so on, but they were not used very long. They fell out of use. So that idea, although it sounds very, very attractive, 
seems not to be widely used. And I think the reason is that subconsciously you recognize that machine learning lacks something. And to get that in your heads clearly, I go back to my own experience of the matter. Back in the early 40s, when I was at Illinois, engineering school, big one, there was at any one hour of the day at least one calculus class for differential calculus and one for integral calculus. And sometimes there'd be two sections at the same hour. That meant an awful lot of professor contacts. So I said to myself, if I were to build a huge thick book like this, backing up your calculus text, every time you're stuck, there it is. If I produce movies of professors giving lectures and carefully prepared ones, if I gave you all kinds of backup, would not the thing be better for the students. They could learn at their own time. They wouldn't have to meet the class hours. They can go in and call the film when they want. They can study when they want to. They got flexibility. Wouldn't it be better? Well, it'd be better for calculus. It'd be better for big, big, big. Suppose we try it for the whole university, maybe excluding gymnasium and sports, but otherwise we do it all. Then you ask yourself, if your child went to college for four years and never had a professor, would you consider that an education? You say no, and suddenly you realize that education, to a great extent, includes human contact and learning to adjust to social situations. That the machine education lacks very badly a human contact, which is a great deal of learning. Learning to get along with other people, learning to get along with professors who have crazy ideas, how do you adjust to them? Professors who have different ways of thinking, how do you learn to listen and follow them? This is part of what is going on in school. And therefore, the mechanization of education leaves something to be desired very much. You can call it, if you wish, my favorite word, the socialization of the human person. Lack of socialization is very serious. Two of the smartest mathematicians out, one of them is dead now, uh, were educated at home. Both of them had rotten human relations. Both of them had a very, very poor feeling of how other people felt, acted, and thought. Yes, they learned more. They were geniuses. Both of them well-recognized geniuses. They did tremendous work. But also, they had never been socialized at a time when they should have been, and later years, never socialized. I mean, I worked with one of them for many years, for 10 years or something, and he just lacked social things. In fact, the other day, I was talking to a friend on the phone who also knew him quite well. And we both agree that he just was not, he could not understand other people because he had not been socialized. He'd been allowed to learn on his own with a private tutor. Now I want to talk to another project called Plato. This was a big project went on for years at the University of Illinois with a big computer. And a friend of mine was running it. And I would meet him at various meetings. And one time I took a long flight on the same plane and we talked. He said, one time Plato had a student from Scotland, one from Canada, and one from Kentucky. And I said to him, I know the telephone company can connect them up. That has nothing to do whatsoever with how good is the system. None whatsoever. What I want to know is, do the students learn more, better, faster? Well. The contention was, with no real evidence, they learn 10% faster. So I said to him, does that mean that it's 10% all the way along? Or does it mean each course is 10% so that each year I'm sort of saving one month? At the end of 24 years, I'll be two years ahead. He didn't know. He never had any data that I could see that proved anything other than his assertions that the students liked it, or this was that, or a lot of students were here, there, and yon. Later on, when I was at Irvine, it happened that a young a lady, not so young anymore, who had worked for me at Bell Labs and left, and she was now divorced and working with a professor on educating for physics. And so I got to see the inside. The professor had a good idea, but the program being written for the computer delivered to the student, were written not by him, but by the stooges, by the people below, the less imaginative people. 
not the really smart guy. Well, the lessons look like what you'd expect then. And this is often what happens. That the professor is so busy raising money and doing other things and managing a project that the professor does not do the actual writing and presenting, presenting the material to the student, but rather is left to less able people. And so you get what you'd expect. Now, once I was editor, chief editor of all the ACM publications, and a program book came in for publication. A program book is about the following. A question is asked. Depending upon your answer, you are sent to one place or another. Now, if you've got the right answer, you're sent on. If you've got the wrong answer, one type, you're sent over there, and it gives an explanation, then you're sent back. If you have another different wrong answer, you're sent over there, and you can see how it's going to work. In principle, the guy who knows everything reads right straight through and passes. The student who is somewhat ignorant is sent on many of these other trails to get reinforcement and learning until they can get their way through. Now, it's bound as a book, but it's not a book. You can't browse it. If you remember seeing something yesterday, you can't leave your way back easily because you don't know what branches you came from. Now, modern disks do the same thing, and you might there put it in in the machine. As you go down the thing, the machine could record for you just what path you came down so you could browse back. So it, that worst feature at that time can be mitigated bit a bit by computers with a fair amount of memory to track. Well, I didn't want to go on my own judgment, so I trotted down to the social science department and found a guy there who did know the subject. Now, that was the great thing about Bell Labs. You got a problem. <laughs> There's somebody around there who knows. For example, I was putting in a waterfall in the backyard. And I needed a pump. I go down to some place. I get some reference. I go down and talk to the guy, and he tells me all about pumps. He tells me just about how much I have to have and where I can buy the damn thing. That was the nice thing about Bell Labs. There's always an expert. But this guy not only told me what he knew, but he said, look, the next week there's a conference on program learning. Why don't you go? So why not? I go, and it happens I sit down next to him the first morning, and he nudges me and says, watch, he says, no one will ever produce any real evidence. They will all talk about how good it is, how wonderful it is, and so on. There will be no real hard evidence. And he was right. There wasn't one drop of it. You were told why it would be good and everything else like that, but genuine experiments allowing for the Hawthorne effect, forget it. They were not there. Well, I reject the book, and on hindsight, I don't think I did wrong, but I'm not sure, of course. Now, another terrible fact about those kind of things comes out when you watch. And since if it's on a machine, you can watch by various methods, namely, you can arrange that your computer is following what the student's computer has or it can record, or various other things. It can snoop very well. It is found the following, that the good student looking at the answers will take what he knows is a stupid answer merely to find out what on earth the book is going to say. Out of boredom, the good students frequently will pick the wrong answer, knowing it's wrong, just to see what the book's going to say about it. Is it going to say, boy, were you stupid, didn't you think about this or that? They do it out of amusement because they're bored. Therefore, the claim that the better students will get through faster is not really true. The better students wander around too, but they wander around for a different reason. So it really isn't true what you think is going to happen with this wonderful idea that each student will go at their own pace. It doesn't work out. Now, I didn't, let's see. I've given you some of the negative side. Now, let's talk about the positive side of CAI. I think few of you would disagree that if your child has to memorize the multiplication table one digit by one digit, then a computer which takes them through with problems, notices that they have trouble with sevens, or when the first digit is larger than the second digit, or maybe when it's fir first digit is less, it files away gradually the pattern of trouble the student is having, and then deliberately produces problems designed to test that part. I think most of you will probably agree that the student may very well learn better. Although children are human, the reinforcement from an adult or a parent that you got it right or wrong is more effective than a machine telling you right or wrong. 
So even then, there may be some doubt, but I think most of you would agree that that low level of real rote mechanical memorization, probably machine learning can be made somewhat better if it's done intelligently. It can sort of tailor the learning to the difficulties the person is having within some latitude. Let me go to another one. I've used it several times. We have pilot trainers. There, I don't think any of you will disagree that the pilot learns far faster and far better with a pilot trainer than he will ever learn with real planes. Because we can run them through many experiences which might risk their life and other things. It might risk ruining a plane. Uh, and we do it so realistically that the pilots come out sweating. But we give them a wide range of experience. Now, there again, while there is some brains in piloting, much of it is trying to get a conditioned response so the pilot will respond instinctively to the situation. Now, I happen as a child, I took up fencing. You have to parry the thrust without benefit of thought. When he lunges, you've got to parry without thinking. There isn't time. That doesn't mean you don't have a plan for fencing. But you have to get fencing down so that you throw your wrist back and forth without benefit of thought. You have to, re and much of life requires this kind of a thing. Driving a car sooner or later becomes, you have to yank the wheel or put your foot in the brake instinctively without stopping to think. There is a great deal of that. Now, machines may very well help in those areas to some extent. And after all, we do have machines. My neighbor down the street bit bought a machine with pitch baseballs at the child so baseball, the child could practice batting. We do have these kind of things around for certain kinds of practice, which are mechanical and instinctive. They've got to be brought down to that level where you don't think, you just do like running an abacus. If you're oriental, you learn, learn an abacus, flick the beads. The flicking the beads is done more or less here, not up here. They learn how to do it by so much practice. Now, when I first came to Naval Postgraduate School, there was a dean. I still go to lunch with him. He quit being a dean now, thank God. He was concerned with extension division education. And since I came from Bell Labs where I'd learned system engineering. I was coming here. I started looking at education as a system, as a whole. What in hell are we trying to do? What is the educated person? So on. Well, he and I used to have some rather hot arguments. One day I walked in his office and said, Dean, I'm teaching a weightlifting class. Now, he knew I was not. I said, graduation is lifting 250 pounds. I find the students get discouraged, they drop out, they repeat the course, and very few graduate. But last night I had a real good idea, I said. I'll cut the weights in half. They will lift up 125 pounds, set them down. Lift up 125 pounds, set them down. They lift 250 pounds. They graduate. I waited for him to smile, as you're sort of saying, that's ridiculous. And I said, since he had once been the head of the math department, if I find an easier proof of a theorem, have I cut the weights in half? Have I? If I make learning easier, am I cutting the weights in half? Am I not in some sense trying to develop your mental muscles as you are trying to develop your physical muscles? Your lifting weights is only a means to an end. You really didn't want to get those weights lifted and dropped down again any more than when you run a mile. You want to get around that mile because you end up where you started. It wasn't running the mile that you wanted to accomplish. It was what the mile running implied about other aspects of your life. In the same way, weightlifting. By and large, unless you want to be a weightlifter, lifting weights is a means to an end. It is not an end in itself. You accomplish nothing. You lift them up and set them back down again. No progress. It's what it does to you. In the same way, if I do not somehow rather develop your mental muscles, am I doing my job? I suggest there is the part that is very, very difficult to cope with. Now, don't interpret the conclusion immediately that I favor bad lecturing. No, 
But transparently good lecturing is not necessarily good. And the two examples are Feynman and uh, Fermi. Feynman's book on physics you can get still. So he, very, very colorful, brilliant lecturer. Very good man. But, you know, you really won't learn how to do physics that way. He skates around troubles like that and gives you colorful, brilliant answers for just the situation he's giving you. Fermi was even worse, I think. I caught him one sequence lectures one time at Los Alamos. He said, well, the log of infinity is 20, and goes ahead. Log of infinity is 20. One time he said, well, log of infinity is 10, and went ahead. Without one word of explanation, why did he shift from 20 to 10? Well, my friend Metropolis, who was at Los Alamos with me, went back all the way. He was in Chicago for a while, and he used to go in, so he said, to a lecture by Fermi. He would have a pad of paper, and he was going to take notes. And everything Fermi said was so brilliantly clear that when he came to leave, there was nothing on the sheet of paper. But when he got back to his office and tried to think, Fermi had gone around the troubles like this, and he didn't notice what Fermi was avoiding, and he <laughs> fell in the first hole. Many so-called brilliant lectures, in fact, do this. They carefully avoid the trouble, and they make you feel like you've been taken through a beautiful scenic trip. Yes, you have been. But is that really educating you? Or is it entertaining you? I claim that there are two aspects of education. You have to know about them. Now, I gave you a rule several times. But I'll give it to you again. That which you learn from others, you can use to follow. That which you learn for yourself, you can use to lead. I have found it being very, very true when I examined other people. I didn't make that thing up. I talked to great many people. What made them do this, that, and the other thing? And again and again, I found that what enabled them to do that great creative act was something they had studied on their own and really knew. Now, there's two problems. One is, to what extent shall I justly compare mental muscles with physical muscles? Both of them apply the ability to do something difficult. I'm trying to build up your ability to cope with difficult things, and I think in that sense, it's a reasonable thing to talk about. Now, another argument I have with the same dean, he had these extension divisions, and he was perfectly willing to let an extension student drag on as long as the student wanted to complete the course. And I said, nonsense. You don't want the chief of staff to be a slow learner. You want to be a pretty fast learner. Not that fast is everything. But people take a very, very long time to learn. We don't really want to promote very far. We want people who are rapid learners and can use their brain rapidly to be in charge. So that contrary to what he said, I maintain that by God, the ability to learn fairly rapidly was an important part of getting education. Now the fundamental trouble with CAI and all of education is very, very simple. I cannot tell you what the education person is, nor can you. I can only tell you one thing, that in a discussion with you about what the education person, educated person is, your definition will turn out that you're educated. What we're trying to do, we don't know. How we do it, if we do it, we don't know. We keep thinking that we turn out some educated people. Because after all, we turned you out, you're educated. We turned out me, I must be educated. We really don't know what we're doing, so how can I possibly measure whether a machine is doing successively? But far worse, as I've emphasized you regularly, what the education person is today is not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in you in the year 2020. Roughly. I'm interested in educating you for your future, which I don't know. I have only been trying to give you some clues in this class, a vague idea of what the world will be like in 2020. I'm fairly confident that you'll have laptop computers available in class, book size, with storage such that uh, the whole damn course is on one disk. In fact, it may be all a 
textbooks that you're going to use for that term are on the disk you carry right in your class right with you anytime. How can the professor go on lecturing the facts when it's all there? Furthermore, how can he go on lecturing on the methods? Take, for example, calculus, which is one of my favorite ones. I've taught here a lot of times, although they won't let me do it anymore because they want their own department to teach it to keep their own department employed. Somewhere in the 60s, a blind programmer at MIT named Slagle wrote a program that would do analytic integration. That, that is, given sine x dx, it would give you out minus cosine x plus constant. That's what I mean by analytic integration. It would do about as well in range of what it could do as the MIT undergraduate could do, and it could do it about the same cost as a student. Now, this was done in the old world when it was just a slow machine. Obviously, with greatly decreased cost of machine and greatly increased capacity, we now have programs which will beat anybody at doing analytic integration at cheaper than you can put your pencil to paper and get away with it at any reasonable cost. But we're still teaching you analytic integration. Why? Well, when I write You learn that. That's the basic one you learn. But I give it in a neural disguises. X now becomes sine x. That's the cosine x dx. This becomes some other expression. That's another one. I give it in a thousand disguises. And you've got a whole bunch of forms. So when you see an integral in my class, you have to recognize an underlying pattern. That's the trouble. You have to recognize an underlying pattern. This is something that I do deliberately. I give you such variety you cannot memorize your way through. Now, a lot of people memorize your way through a lot. For example, a friend of mine who's a PhD says that when he took calculus at Harvard, he learned how to do the delta process to find the derivative, but he did not understand what it was. He just learned how to do it. He got an A in the course, he could do it, but he really didn't know what he was doing two years later. Many students in mathematics are able to memorize their way through and do it without a glimmer of an idea of what is going on. Well, here, if you're going to get through my course, you're going to learn pattern recognition. You're going to learn it's a very difficult thing. In fact, in some sense, it's a measure of intelligence. Have you seen the same situation before in some other way? Does it remind you of something else? Can you associate this with this? Do you see that that is nothing else than this? This is one of the basic things of intelligence. Recognition of very different things are the same in some disguise. Well, if I were to install this analytic integration program and give the students the integration, fine. They'll now be able to cover analytic integration in much less time. But they will not have learned pattern recognition. When I cut the weights in half, should I not somewhere else put in the 250 pounds to lift? If the 250 pounds here are suddenly made 125 twice, had I not better put somewhere else in the class the 250 pound weight? Or am I cheating the students? It's a hard, hard problem. It's a very hard one. Now, there's a similar error made at the University of Chicago when I was there as a graduate student, undergraduate. They had an education department, and the education department ran a laboratory, which was really a grammar school at a high school. They took in students, they students paid some tuition, but fundamentally these were vehicles to study. Well, they discovered what you all know, that you don't really read words by letters, you read them by syllables and other things. Oh, so they said, what the hell? If that's the way the students learn, let's teach it this way. So they did. And by God, the students did learn to read. Everything went along fine. They're now in late high school. And they're now coming to the thing about looking up words in dictionaries and other things. The kids don't know the alphabet. They never learned it. Well, at high school, can you make a child overlearn the alphabet so much that when you look at a dictionary, you can read backward and forward, you know which way to go if you've got a letter, 
Even when you're partway down the line, you still know whether to look forward or backward. I think you'll find that you cannot get the average high school student to so over-memorize the alphabet that they can use dictionaries and telephone directories and so on. So consequently, something which seemed of no importance at the time they left it out and it saved time turned out to be almost fatal to those people. I've often wondered what that whole five or ten years of students going through the system, how they coped with life. Now you recognize that the alphabet ordering, which we use so many, like telephone directories, dictionaries and so on, we use many, is totally arbitrary. The items themselves do not have that order. We impose the order from the names of the items, and the names have nothing to do with the thing itself. If trees precede a fall of bushes, it's because B is before tree, T, not because bushes precede trees in any other sense. They did a great deal of damage by not doing it, and I am very worried about the attempt to change what has been found to work and make a mistake like that. It's a Lulu. Now consider again what I've talked about last time, or the time before, in simulation. I give you war gaming or business gaming. Have I got the model right? In particular, business gaming. If we taught business gaming regularly to all business administrators, they would all know the other guy's strategy and therefore know what the other guy would do and they could do something else and win. You see how, in some sense, you could not trust what you had learned in that way of behaving. Thus, if in military, if you want, if everybody is trained the same way, and this is how you do things all the time, and the guy learns how to do it, if you're a little smarter, you know, deviate from what you were taught. It'll ruin the other person. I did this to my brother. I'm sorry, my brother did me. I was playing chess when I was a young kid, and I was kind of bright and just to show off, I used to play him, I'd be blindfolded with my back to the chessboard on the beach, watching the pretty girls go by while he made the moves. And I'd say, okay, king bishop, queen bishop, four, something like that. And uh, I would win until he started making irregular, ridiculous moves. And then I collapsed. I couldn't do it. Now, if I was played enough, I could still do it. But basically, people who play chess blindfolded, follow a standard pattern and notice small deviations. If the person plays a complete random game, you're in trouble trying to play blindfolded chess. Patterns are needed. You have to have them. So if you had wargaming and everybody learned the same wargaming, what you'd better do is not play a wargaming response. Otherwise, you'll probably lose. Now, let me close with some other observations about education. Several hundred years ago, the education in England was heavily Latin. You read Latin, you read Caesar, you read Latin poetry. Indeed, you were required to compose poems in Latin. You got a smattering of Greek, but it was a heavy education. There was no technical content with beans. It was a literary education. With this education, the English went out and created an enormous empire. The education you have, almost all of you, has nothing in common with that. Most of you probably can't do Latin. You probably have never written a Latin poem. You probably have, a couple of you do know Greek, of course, but uh, most of you couldn't do Greek. We give a completely different education. Now, there's negligible in common with what the classic education in England was. I suggest to you the proper education in the year 2020 will be as different from what we're now doing as was that from us. Our education we've been giving for a while was very appropriate for the time we were living in. It was very appropriate for my background and what I did. But I can see vast holes in my education. Particularly, I was not given a humanistic attitude, and you've heard me say again and again, I found that the human factors and legal factors controlled what the technical decision would always work out to be. That the human factors dominated in many situations. The 
actual engineering details. I've been stressing this all the way along. I learned it very slowly and painfully as I watched and marvel at once why some projects succeeded and some other ones didn't. Having been there, I knew the technical decisions. I knew why it should work and why it didn't. And I can give you one, for example. It's a very lovely one. Long ago, Bell Labs and AT&T started a picture phone experiment. It turned out to be a big disaster. AT&T lost a lot of money. But as a pilot study, Bell Labs did the following. They put a picture phone on each executive's desk. Every executive had a picture phone. We put, paid the cost to connect them all up and so on for experiment. And there was a button which you could set one way or the other. One showed on your screen what the other person looked like. The other showed what you looked like to the other person. So you could see just how you looked. Then we went around sometime later, three or four months in, and we looked. Almost all the executives had set the switch so they could see what they looked like. They were not looking at the other person. The other person was not looking at them. You're really not surprised when I tell you, are you? When I reveal what really happened, you know that's what did happen. I'm not lying to you. I'm not making it up. We were not smart enough. We didn't know humans enough, so we could have saved that whole damn experiment if we'd known human behavior. I say the engineering education we usually gave to people like me lacked very much the human side of the education. What the future one is going to be, I'm not sure, but I do not think that what we're now fiddling around with, tinkering with this and that, trying to change it a little bit here, there, and yon, will do the trick. Somehow or other, something else will go up. Now, what happened at Oxford and Cambridge? It was other schools came up and started doing the job that they slowly responded with more technical education. Very slowly. The classic ones, as they call it, Oxbridge, the classic education in England responded very slowly. Other institutions started doing it. Trade schools and so on did it. I suspect that uh, universities will find themselves the same way. They are really badly out of date for the education you need for the year 2020, which is about 25 years from now, but is where you really are going to be making your big decisions which will affect society. The ones you make along the way are a nuisance. You can blunder here, there, and yon. But when you're in the top and you make mistakes, they are extremely expensive. So coming back to computer-aided instruction, I want to summarize it. Yes, insofar as we are talking about training, I think computer-aided instruction will be a big help. Insofar as we're talking about education, I doubt that they will do any good. In fact, I think they'll do more harm than good. This school, according to all the admirals I had so far over to dinner, they've all said it's either 60% education, 40 training, or they've said 70% education, 30 training. They do not think that this place is a training place. They think it's an education place. The faculty frequently acts differently. This course is an attempt to educate you, not train. I told you repeatedly, there's no real content. I don't care whether you learn about digital filters or not. I tried to tell you how things work. I'm trying to educate you. But I admit, I don't know what the education person is, and I don't know how to do it other than what I've been doing, telling you a lot of anecdotes and stories of how I saw things work out. Is Rather than what they were supposed to do, they worked out this way. And amazing things happened. I guess I didn't tell you one amazing ones. There was, in the Nike project, a lovely ramp built at great expense, along with a blue room where admirals could sit, or generals, and they could watch. This great big analog computer was there, a big, huge one those days. And the idea was you'll bring in a fin or a gyro, and we will connect it up and simulate the whole rest. And we can test how the fins work, how the gyros work. We do every one of these things. And I thought that was a great idea. Jesus, it seemed great. Now, since they had that big analog computer there, and I was involved in computing, I was frequently over there getting some technician to unsolder the solder joints they had made and solder them some different ways, so I had a different computer. After all, the same raw parts were there, and I was constantly using the machine as a poor general purpose analog computer. 
solving military problems, so they had to do it. I wasn't cheating at solving Bell Lab problem, I was solving military problems, but I was solving different ones than that particular Nike on the Nike equipment. So I knew what went on. I was there one day a week, typically every Thursday. I had friends who were busy trying to wire up the post for connecting the gyro. When it was all over, and I was being thoughtful, let's see now, what happened to this whole Nike project? Hmm, gee, that happened. Up. Suddenly I realized I had never seen a part brought in and tested. Never mind the work they put in, I had never seen one. So me being me, which you know is a bastard, I went around to various bosses along the way and said, you were going to do this. You were going to bring in some fins and test them. How come you didn't? Well, I got an alibi. I asked the guy about gyros. How come you didn't? Each guy I talked to, boss up line, why didn't they do this thing? With this carefully prepared ramp and everything else all prepared to do this thing, they didn't do it. Their excuses were different. I came out of the realization that you don't test equipment that way. You test it some other way. Well, this is what I mean. Things are not what they seem to be at all. You think, that, of course, that was a great idea. Of course, what could have been better? I was flatly wrong. I thought it was a great idea. I was looking forward to see how it was going to work out. It didn't. Psychologically, it was something else entirely. And this is what I'm troubled with, that we tend to tell you how engineering should work. And we don't understand enough about the psychology of engineers, the psychology of technically trained people, to see that they don't really behave the way they're supposed to be behaving. Let alone the other nuts who are not trained technically. They're even worse. But technical people don't behave rationally according to their own criteria. I should be preparing you. I should be teaching you psychology and other things. If only I knew what to do, but I don't. So I can only tell you anecdotes to tell you things don't work out the way they're supposed to. They don't even work out logically. So that's the best I'm doing. Next time I'll take up the subject of uh, mathematics. I'll talk about quantum mechanics and we're drifting along happily. And there'll be one more lecture on uh, what amounts to epistemology. We tucked in somewheres. Okay. <laughs>